Pleasing God is the purpose for every believer. And God has a plan. There was a track, a gospel track years ago, still active. The four spiritual laws and law number one is God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. He does. God loves you. He has a will, a purpose, a plan that is fulfilling and satisfying. It's God's plan for a meaningful life. We know it is God's will and God's purpose that every person come to faith in Jesus Christ. He said, God is not willing that any should perish. God is not willing. That's his will. And if you do not know Christ as your Savior, I can tell you where to start. Start by repenting of your sins, receiving Christ into your life, trusting him as your Lord and Savior. It is God's will that you come to him and that, that you do it today. But once you become a believer... God's will also becomes clear as we walk with him and live to please him. And the Apostle Paul, who gave us these words under the authority of the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God, is speaking with us as though he is a pastoral counselor. It is as though we are having a conversation with the great Apostle Paul as he talks with us as to how we are to pursue life and to live to please God. And so in verse 3, he says, For this is the will of God, here it is, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body, watch this, in holiness and honor. Not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles, that is the unbelievers, who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger. He gives justice in all these things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives the Holy Spirit to you. It is God's will that we be sanctified. What does that mean? Well, Paul gives us the example here, when he talks to us about personal sexual purity, morality, morality. And I want to show you in this passage today, not only the mandate for our sexual purity, the must for our sexual purity, but I want to show you the means for our sexual purity and the motivation for this purity. First, the must or the mandate for sexual purity. When you look at our text, verse 3, chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Abstain means abstain. Not avoid, abstain. Not accept, abstain. It is abstinence. God has given sex as a gift. He has blessed it within the beauties of Christian marriage and family. And he has told us clearly again and again in Scripture that God has given us this gift. It was his idea, but it is not to be abused. It is not to be taken outside the borders of home and family and marriage. It's like a garden. If you have a beautiful garden with flowers and dirt and everything that you put in a garden, it's beautiful in the garden. But you take several buckets full of dirt and you pour it in your living room, not good. So within the parameters of God's purpose for sex and marriage, he has said, enjoy. 
But beyond that, sex before marriage, sex during marriage, outside of the marriage relationship, God says, don't do it. You're not smarter than God. And if you live God's way and love God's way, he will give you great joy and happiness. But if you don't, there are consequences. This is a commandment, not a suggestion. That's why the scripture says here, if you disregard this in verse 8, you're disregarding not man, not what Jack Graham thinks, but God who gives the Holy Spirit to you. That is, if you are a believer, you have the Holy Spirit. You know what is right. You know what God's word says. Uh, Paul expands on this just a page over in 1 Thessalonians 5, 22 and 23. Look at it. It says, abstain from every form of evil. This is 1 Thessalonians 5, 22 and 23. Abstain from every form of evil. Every form of it. Not only the act, the physical act, the sexual act, but every form of impurity. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Think of holiness as being wholeness. Wholeness. That your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless, not perfect, but blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Abstain. Abstain. I like what the Apostle Paul also said. Don't miss this. Ephesians 5 verse 1. We'll put it on the screen for you. Here's what the scripture says. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is what we are to do. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness, may it not even be named among you as is proper among saints. You a saint? You a child of God? Don't let it be named among you. Verse 4, let there be, he expands the idea, let there be no filthiness, no foolish talk, no crude joking, that is nasty, filthy joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, that is living this lifestyle, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God and Christ. That word there, or the verse 3, when it says, let not sexual immorality or all any impurity even be named among you. I like the way the ESV, the English Standard gives that phrase. It says, let there not be a hint, a hint of immorality or impurity about you, around you, on you. Not a hint, not a scent, not even the smell of sin. Don't let the filth of this world get into your life. We are in the world, but we don't want the world to be in us. Fortunately, we're becoming more and more like the world and less and less like Jesus. Every day, people all over the world make choices without a second thought. But the choices we make ultimately make us. And that's why I've written the book, Choices. In Choices, we can learn about the powerful, timeless wisdom of the Word of God, especially as seen in the book of Proverbs, and how God's Word and God Himself will help you choose His way and His will in every aspect of your life. This book will give you both personal and practical wisdom, which is seeing things from God's perspective to guide you through the critical decisions you face every single day. So call now, the number on the screen, or visit us online at jackgraham.org to donate to this ministry. And when you do, please be sure to request your copy of Choices. This powerful resource shows you how to make decisions God's way. 
and enjoy the life God has created for you to live. You say, okay, pastor, I get it. I'm a teenager. My hormones are raging. You're telling me to abstain. How am I supposed to do that? I'm tempted. There are triggers. I'm addicted to certain behaviors in my life. How do I live differently than the world? It's interesting that in 1 Thessalonians, back to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 4, it says that each of you know how. Know how. I think it's also written as learn how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Control your own body. How? We learn how to be pure. How to live a godly life in an ungodly world, a pure life in an impure light world, a moral life in an immoral world. How? P-U-R-E. Pure. And with these, with these words, I've got a little acrostic for you today to, to give you a plan. And the, and the, first, the first word is, is, is P, it is prepare for spiritual attack. You say, well, you know, this, this message isn't really for me. You know, I'm beyond all this now. I'm sanctified beyond all this. You tell those teenagers, Pastor, the Scripture says, let him who stands take heed lest he fall. David, the great king, was a man after God's own heart when he sinned his great sin of adultery with Bathsheba. You're not better than David. You're not better than Paul, who himself confronted uh, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. So we're, we're all in, and therefore we have to prepare for spiritual attack. Put on the full armor of God. Satan is like a roaring lion, prowling and, and provoking whom he may devour. We are to discipline our minds and our bodies like an athlete. Paul did the same thing, 1 Corinthians 9. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So Paul said, love the fact that Paul loved athletics. He loved the, loved the games, the races, the boxing. And he said, I don't run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. He said, I'm not playing here. I'm fighting the real fight. And he went on to say, I discipline, I buffet my body so that I, having preached to others, might become a castaway, might be set on the bench. You know, every Christian ought to run a little bit scared that somehow you could take a sucker punch and go down because you weren't ready, you weren't disciplined. So prepare yourself for spiritual attack. Paul said, what, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? This is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't desecrate the temple. Paul says, take the temple, your body, and live with holiness and honor. You are the created of God and redeemed by Christ. You're not an animal. You're not the byproduct of evolution. You are handmade by God. You are the temple of God. Don't desecrate the temple. Don't desecrate what God has made. You are created. Don't cheapen what God has made. That's what he's saying. And then you, pure Undo defiling associations. Undo defiling associations. Remove, listen very carefully. Remove from yourself any friendship, any association, any person, place, thing, activity, entertainment, amusement. Get rid of anything in your life that brings you down. Pleasures, people, places, things, activities, entertainment. Get rid of that stuff. 
anything that would weaken your ability to abstain from sexual sin. Run, flee. That's what Joseph did. When, when Joseph was accosted, seduced, attempted to be seduced by Potiphar's wife, he didn't stay around and talk about it and discuss it. He put on his PF flyers and ran like crazy. She grabbed his coat. He lost his coat, but he kept his character. Right? Because he ran. The Bible says flee fornication. Run from it. When, when, when evil shows up, get out. You know why Joseph got out and refused to compromise his convictions? Because God had given him a dream bigger than that. God's given you students, teenagers, boys and girls, all of us. He's given us a dream bigger than the world can give you. Don't sell your dream for something cheap. Don't sell your life out for something that won't last. Joseph had a dream that God would elevate him in due season. So he kept his dream alive by saying no. He said, how can I do this great wickedness in the sight of God? You got to resist it and get yourself out of it. Get yourself out of it. Don't give the devil a stick to hit you with. Fight your way through. The Holy Spirit is in you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And that's why Paul ends this passage by saying, who gives us the Holy Spirit, who gives the Holy Spirit to you. Or remember the consequences. Remember the consequences. In verse 6, he says, let no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. In other words, don't cheat your brother. There's no such thing as silent sin, solitude in sin, or casual sin. There are consequences to sin. It affects other people. You can't, you can't say, well, it's just between me and her or me and him or whatever. You can't say that. Because no one sins alone in this matter, certainly not a Christian. He says, you're defrauding your brother in this. You know what that means? You're cheating on your brother. You're cheating on your wife. You're cheating on your kids. You're cheating on your church. You're cheating on your friends. Don't defraud your brother. Don't say, well, what I do is between me and myself and I. No, if you are a Christian and a member of this church, what I do affects you, what you do affects me. And frankly, we've been through that a time or two around here and some sins affect all of us like no others. It impacts everybody. And if you are thinking about cheating on yourself and cheating on your wife and cheating on God, just remember you're cheating on your kids, you're cheating on your church family, and ultimately, you are responsible to God because God says he is the avenger. He said, now you're trying to scare me? Well, if I could, I would. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He is the avenger. Be sure your sin will find you out. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. So before you decide to go out and have a little fling with your secretary, before you decide to cheat on your husband, remember there is a God in heaven who knows and sees it all. And he is the avenger, that is he brings justice. And he will bring discipline if you are a believer whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son. You can't get away with this. You say, well, I've been getting away with it a long time. You know why? You're not a believer. God's just letting you go on. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, a follower of Jesus, you're not going to get away with it. I promise you, you're not going to get away with it. There's no secret sin, no solitary sin. You defraud your brother, you defraud God, you defraud the Holy Spirit, you grieve the Holy Spirit. Oh, it's really quiet in here. <laughs> I 
to end on a positive note. E, engage in positive spiritual activities. Engage in positive spiritual activities. All right, here's your game plan. Prepare for spiritual attack every day. Put on the armor of God. Suit up. Get your game face on. Go. Every day. In the power of Jesus Christ. Undo defiling associations of your life. Get away. Get, get, be done with the pleasures and people and things and activities and entertainment and stuff. Some of you on those premium channels, you're watching soft porn. You're bringing that filth into your house. Be done with that. Undo a filing, defiling associations. Remember the consequences of sexual sin and then engage in positive spiritual activities. Fortify your faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Psalm 119 says, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Jesus spoke of the sanctifying power of his word. Sanctify them. My word is true. Uh, we talk about this all the time, so I'm not going to elaborate, but you got to fortify your faith, strengthen your faith against the enemy. And the way you do that is the filling of the Spirit by walking in the Word. Purify your thought life. Don't be conformed to this world, Romans 12, 2, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Some of you keep running the old film from the past. You got to renew your mind. And the only way to wash your mind, cleanse your mind, is to fill it with God's Word. Fill it with God's truth. Purify your thought life. Don't, don't consider lust. Don't, don't contemplate sexual behavior outside of God's plan for your life. Purify your thought life. Identify accountability partners. Have positive influences in your life that will encourage you and challenge you and, and not necessarily call you out, but call you up. Typically, we get in trouble when we get isolated and alienated, alone. That's why we need each other. And then finally, magnify the Lord Jesus. If you love Jesus, then the love and the things of this world will fade away. My Jesus, I love thee. Know thou art mine, for thee all the follies of sin I resign. Some would say, I've already got a past. I've got a history. I wish I'd have heard this. May I, you can't imagine how many emails I got this past week after part one of this. It said, I wish I'd have heard that years ago. But here's the good news. There's no sin that God cannot forgive. There's no unpardonable sin. His grace is greater than all our sin. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all our sin. We can't always change the consequences. In fact, we can't change the consequences of some of the decisions that we've made in the past. You can't unscramble eggs. But God can change your present, forgive your past, and give you a brand new future with him. Jesus came not to condemn, but to save. When a woman caught in the very act of adultery was brought to him, they said, stone this woman. He said, who among you has not sinned? Would cast the first stone? None. They all walked away. Jesus looked at her with love and said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You can have a new beginning, a new life, a new love in Christ if you will come to Him. God is a holy God, and God is calling us to holiness. And that word holiness means to be separate, unique, distinct, holy. God is holy, holy, holy. Now, I know that word may sound like an antique the word holiness. Not too many people talk about it today, and yet the Bible says, be holy as God is holy. What does that mean? It means that we should raise our standards to live lives that please God, not lower our standards, but to lift our standards, and as believers and followers of Jesus, 
we should seek holiness, personal holiness, integrity, character in our lives. As we learn today in our nation and in our churches, there seems to be a disconnect about what we say we believe and how we actually live our lives. And unfortunately, all kinds of surveys and statistics tell us that there's very little difference, it appears, between the lives of those who profess faith in Jesus Christ and those who do not practice or accept Jesus Christ regarding all kinds of things. There's no difference in the divorce rate, for example, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, pornography. It's, it's truly disheartening when you read some of these statistics. And as much as we hate to admit it, the church, including many of us, many of its leaders, have accommodated to the culture. We have compromised, and therefore we are sliding downward. We are slouching towards Gomorrah, as one man wrote. God has called us not to acceptance, but to abstinence from an opposition to all kinds of sin, including sexual sin. Sexual sin has eternal and devastating physical, emotional, relational, and spiritual consequences in our lives. Yet every day, people make really bad choices about their personal behavior, about their morality, without even a second thought. But the choices we make ultimately make us. And that's why I've written the book, Choices. In Choices, we learn about the powerful, timeless wisdom of God that's described in the book of Proverbs and how it can help each one of us to choose God's way and God's will in every aspect of our lives, body, soul, and spirit. This book will give you personal and practical wisdom to guide you and guard you through the critical daily decisions that we all face. So call the number on the screen or visit us online at jackgram.org to donate to our ministry and request your copy of Choices. You'll like this book. I really want you to have it. It's also a book that you can give to your children or your grandchildren or friends who have questions about what is right and what is wrong, how to live your life. This powerful resource shows you how to make good decisions right choices so you can experience the power of God, the presence of God in your life, and live the life that God created you to live. Once again, thank you for your support and your love for this ministry that actually translates into prayer and financial support, all the good things that we're doing together with the transforming message of Jesus Christ. Please pray for our country. Pray for people who are struggling with the choices they are making. And please help us help them with the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus.